right. Let's see. As you guys know, we have our new location. So next week, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we will be in our new location. The address is on the screen. Do not show up here. You'll be knocking on the door and nobody will answer. Show them what we're talking about today. I realize that most of you have never even heard of the destruction of Nicanor. So we are going to be covering today why it is that we celebrate the destruction of Nicanor. All right. So this is an Israelite feast day. We're going to go back into the Old Testament. We're going to go all the way to Genesis and we're going to see a promise. And this promise has to do with the destruction of Nicanor. Give me Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, and bring down the beat just a touch more. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, the scripture says, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Who was the Most High talking to? He's talking to Abraham, and look at what he says. He says, I'm going to make of thee a great nation. Because Abraham is the father of many nations. Okay, watch this. And I will bless thee. So he's going to be blessed. And make thy name great. That means he's going to have an amazing reputation. He has an amazing reputation. What, what is his reputation? What was he to the Most High? He was the friend of Yah. And thou shalt be a blessing. Give me verse 3. He says, and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him. Notice that it doesn't say curse them. It says curse him. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. What is in Father Abraham that's going to come out generations down the line that is going to be a blessing to all the families of the earth? Yahweh Shai is in him. This is the co inhering principle. This is the seed principle. Yahweh Shai is in Father Abraham. He is the seed that is going to be the blessing. Does that part make sense? Okay, now take a look at this promise. He says, I will bless them that bless thee. So when you bless me, what happens? You get blessed. When I bless you, you know what happens? I get blessed. But if I curse you, or if you curse me, what happens? We get cursed. We have to be very careful that we are not cursing the children of Israel. Whether they are awake or they're still in their sleep, they're acting crazy out here on these streets. Don't you dare curse them because it will bring a curse upon you. It doesn't say I will bless them that know that they are Israelites. <laughs> it doesn't say that we don't curse anybody. Yahweh Shai spoke on that, didn't he? He's like, what are you supposed to do when somebody curses you? Bless them. You're supposed to bless them. Okay. Now watch this. Our enemies have a plan. This is getting closer to the day of Nicanor destruction. Give me Psalms 83 verse 2. This is the plan of our enemies in relation to us. The scripture says, for lo, thine enemies make a tumult. What does that word mean? Don't guess. A loud noise. The word tumultuous means very loud. It's uproarious. Thine enemies make a tumult. That's how enemies are constantly complaining. It says, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. Do they hate us? They hate him. We are related to him. So we get the hate by a byproduct. If you hate the most high, you hate his children too. Right? Because I'm a reflection of my father. Okay, now watch this verse three. It says... They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. So the other nations are consulting to do something to the children of Israel. Let's find out what it is. Let's keep going. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. What did they do? They tried to completely wipe out the children of Israel. And there's a reason why they want to do that. Because the land that was given to Shem is the best land in the whole world. And they want that land. But they also want all of our blessings, all of our gold, all of our silver. They even decided, well, since we can't cut out their name, let's just take their name. Let's just steal their name and then it'll seem like all these blessings are on us. And whoever blesses us, we'll tell them that they'll get blessed. There's no evidence of that. 
You blessing Palestine has never produced any evidence. Ha. Huh. Okay, now watch this. Give me verse 5. It says, for they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. So all of the Most High's enemies hate the Most High, and they have one agenda. They're going to try to destroy him. There's a picture of this. You guys know they built this uh, big old, um, what's it called? A tower. And they climbed to the top. And what did they try to do? They tried to kill the Most High. He just laughed at him. He's like, that's funny. You think I can die? That's funny. All right? Now watch this. Give me Joel chapter 3, verse 6. This is a part of what they did, and it identifies who the they are. It says, the children of Judah, that's me, I'm from the tribe of Judah, and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians. Where are these Judah cats at? They got sold unto the Grecians. If I'm a Grecian, what am I? I'm Greek, and I'm also a Gentile. So the children of Judah, so-called black people, Benjamin and Levi, we got sold to the Grecians, to the Greeks. It says it clearly there in the scriptures, but we all experienced it. Ain't that right? Transatlantic slave trade is what this verse is talking about. Then it tells you why they did that. It says that ye might remove them far from their border. Why'd they do that? Because they wanted to get us out of the land. And where we at now, we are in our enemy's land. Give me verse seven. He says, behold, I will raise them out of the place where ye have sold them and will return your recompense upon your own head. What does that mean? You cursed them. So I'm going to curse you. The fact that they're scattered, that was the most high's doing. He never meant for us to be sold. That was not part of the punishment. That's what they decided to do. He never meant for us to be killed and raped and hung from trees. He didn't write that in the scriptures. He wrote that he was going to scatter us. Our enemies sold us and killed us. Okay, so they cursed us. Now something has to come back to them because they did that. What did it say? He said to Abraham, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curse thee. Isn't that right? Okay, now let's jump into the story of Nicanor because the destruction of Nicanor is that exact story unfolding. Nicanor is a Greek. Let's just think of him as a general, big old powerful general, right? Over Greek armies. And this is during the time of the 400 years, which uh, modern scholars call the Dark Ages. This takes place between Malachi and Matthew in the Bible, just so that you understand the background. We are living in the land of Jerusalem, but we don't control the land of Jerusalem. We're already enslaved, even in our own land at that time. So there was another king of the Greeks, and he was controlling the land that we lived in, charging us taxes. Let's dive into the story of Nicanor. This is going to be found in 1 Maccabees. All of it is in 1 Maccabees. First and second. First Maccabees chapter seven, verse one. You guys able to see that? It says in the hundred and one and fiftieth year. What year is it? Year 151, right? Demetrius, the son of Seleucius, departed from Rome and came up with a few men unto a city of the seacoast and reigned there. This is where the story begins. That's our first character that we get introduced to. Demetrius, he's the son of Seleucius. Jump down to verse 5. We're not going to read every single line of it. I'm just going to point out what this man does and how he is a picture of the Antichrist because he wants to exterminate the Israelites. He curses them continually and wants to kill all of them. But the Most High has already said, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse you. So what you think happened to this man? Oh, he got cursed. He got cursed for real. All right, now take a look. It says, <clears throat> we're in verse five. It says, there came unto him all the wicked and ungodly men of Israel, having Alcimus, keep track of that name, who was desirous to be high priest for their captain. Let me fill in the story. Okay, so we're under Greek Roman rule at that time. We're not ruling ourselves. This guy named Alcimus, who wants to be a high priest, but has not been elected a high priest of the Most High, nor the people, he wants to be high priest anyway. So he goes and he talks to the leaders in charge with a bunch of other ungodly and wicked Israelites. Okay, let's keep going. Give me verse six. It says, that looks like verse seven. 
Take me back one. Verse 6. It's not there. Okay, I'm going to read this one for you. I may have skipped it. It was there. Oh, take me back. It's on the other slide, right? Take me back. Yeah, verse 6. And they accused the people to the king, saying, Judas, what Judas is that? Judas Maccabeus. That's this why we're reading the book of Maccabees. His name is actually Judah Maccabea. Judah the hammer. That's what Maccabee means, the hammer. It says, and they accused the people to the king, saying, Judas and his brethren have slain all thy friends and driving us out of our own land. So they're making an accusation against the people that are upholding the laws of the Most High. Let's keep going. Verse 7 now. It says, now therefore send some man whom thou trustest and let him go and see what havoc he hath made among us and in the king's land. He just referred to the land of Israel as belonging to the king of another nation. So this guy's wicked, right? Now watch, it says, and let him punish them with all them that aid them. Verse eight. It says, then the king chose Bacchides. A friend of the king who ruled beyond the flood. The flood is the water. So he rules on the other side of the waters. And was a great man in the kingdom and faithful to the king. Give me verse 9. And he sent, and he sent with that wicked Alcimus. So now we have the, the guy who wants to be the high priest. He's from the tribe of Levi. But he's wicked. And now we got Bacchides and they're going together. And it says, whom he made high priest. So what does that mean now? Whoever is ruling the synagogue at this time is a wicked man who bears false witness. He is a liar and he's been put into position by another nation to rule over the most high's people. Okay. The reason why we're sharing this is because this is a picture of what is going to happen. Remember, Nicanor and these stories that are happening in Maccabees are a picture of the coming Antichrist. He will be put into power by another nation, but he will rule along with our people. Okay. Now watch this. It says, hmm. so it says, whom he made high priest and commanded that he should take vengeance of the children of Israel. Verse 10. So they departed and came with a great power into the land of Judea, where they sent messengers to Judas and his brethren with peaceable words, deceitfully. What does that mean? They rolled up and they said, peace. And they had weapons drawn behind their back. They're doing one of these and pulling out a weapon at the same time. That's when you say it's peace, but it's deceitful. Now, here's the interesting thing. The, the opposer of the Most High will always come with deceit. He will always come saying peace, but it'll always be a lie. Isn't that what happens? When the Antichrist comes, he's going to say peace, but then it's all going to be war. Okay, now watch this. Give me a verse 11. It says, but they gave no heed to their words, for they saw that they were come with a great power. So Judas Maccabeus and his boys, he's like, nah, we already know what y'all came to do. Jump to verse 13 for me real quick. It says, now the Assidians, who are the Assidians? Assidians, if we keep reading, it'll tell you. Now the Assidians were the first among the children of Israel that sought peace of them. So the Assyrians are Israelites, but they live in a different area. Does that make sense? Kind of like we would be like, well, here in Phoenix, they're called Phoenicians, but that, we live in Arizona. Okay. So this is a small group of Israelites. They were the first ones that desired peace of the army. Verse 14 says, for said they, one that is a priest of the seed of Aaron is come with his army. And he will do us no wrong. So they saw the man. They said, he's a Levite. He's one of us. He's come with his army, but he's not going to destroy us because what does he know? He knows the law. He's a servant of the most high. There's no way he's going to lay his hands on us. Give me verse 15. It says, so he spake unto them peaceably. And swear unto them, saying, we will procure the harm neither of you nor your friends. Is that the truth? That's a lie. Verse 16. Whereupon they believed him. Howbeit, he took of them threescore men and slew them in one day. According to the words which he wrote. Now, 
Let me explain to you this last line. It says, according to the words which he wrote. Who's the he in that verse? This is, the, this is an example of rightly dividing the word because if you're not rightly dividing it and you don't know the power of precepts, it looks like Alcimus wrote a word. Alcimus did not write a word concerning this slaughter. The Most High had already prophesied that Alcimus would come in and deceive the people and kill them through a great slaughter. Watch. Give me a verse 17 real quick, and then I'm going to show you the prophecy. It says, The flesh of thy saints have they cast out, and their blood have they shed round about Jerusalem, and there was none to bury them. Let's prove that 1 Maccabees and 2 Maccabees is actually a part of the Bible and pull a precept that says the exact same thing from the 66 books. How about that? Give me Psalms chapter 79 verse 1. The scripture says, Oh, Yah, the heathen are come into thine inheritance. That means the land. Thy holy temple have they defiled. They have laid Jerusalem on heaps. Give me verse 2. The dead bodies of thy servants have they given to be meat unto the fowls of the heaven. The flesh of thy saints unto the beasts of the earth. Give me verse 3. It says their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem. And there was none to bury them. You see it says the same thing right? That's how we know. Because when you're using the King James 1611. Uh, the verses that are found in the Apocryphal will have precepts that line up with what it says in the 66 books. Okay. Take me back to 1 Maccabees chapter 7. We're on verse 18. Now watch this. It says. Wherefore the fear and dread of them. That's our enemies. Fell upon all the people. The people is us. Who said. There is neither truth nor righteousness in them, for they have, look at what it says, broken the covenant and oath that they made. This is not what they said. They made an oath. We're not going to do nothing to you and nothing to your people. And as soon as we turned our back, they started murdering us. The Most High had already written that in advance. See, if you stay in the scriptures and you learn what the scriptures is telling you, it will prepare you so that you cannot be deceived. Give me Psalms chapter 55, verse 20. The scripture says, he hath put forth his hands. What did he put forth? His hands. That's a clue when it comes to Nicanor, because this is talking about Nicanor. Because Nicanor was a very proud man, and he would always stretch forth his hand like this, as if he had some power in his right hand. And he had a very stiff neck, so he'd hold his neck up high. It says, he hath put forth his hands against such as be at peace with him. He just made peace with the Assyrians, right? And now he's going to fight with them. What does it say? He hath broken his covenant. Give me verse 21. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. So it's letting you know the background story on how he was able to deceive the children of Israel. Take me back to 1 Maccabees chapter 7. We're in verse 23 now. It says... Now, when Judas saw all the mischief that Alcimus and his company had done among the Israelites, even above the heathen. So who's doing more wickedness? Alcimus and these wicked Israelites or the other nations? That's because a house that is divided against itself cannot stand. If you have somebody within your own congregation, your own army, your own kingdom that is working against you, they're going to cause much damage, even more damage than the enemy could cause because they're able to get closer to you than anybody else. Okay, now watch verse 24. It says he went out. This is Judas into all the coasts of Judea round about and took vengeance of them that had revolted from him so that they durst no more go forth into the country. Judas was a very powerful man. Judas Maccabeus, he had a huge army and the most high was with him. So when he went out to war, they got smoked. I guess I should probably say smoked. They got smoted. <laughs> Verse 25 says, on the other side, when Alcimus saw that Judas and his company had gotten the upper hand and knew that he was not able to abide their force, he went again to the king and said all the worst of them that he could. What is this guy's position? He keeps going back. There's a story being told in here. I want you to see that Alcimus, even though he's an Israelite, he represents Satan because he is continually going to the king 
and accusing the brethren. You see that there's, there's pictures that you have to be able to see in this story in order to understand it. So he's representing Satan. He's going to make the accusation. The king is going to keep sending out men to conquer the children of Israel. Okay. So he goes to them and he says every terrible thing that he can. And then the king said, "Uh Oh, I need to pull out the big dogs. Let me get Nicanor. Verse 26 says, then the king sent Nicanor, one of his honorable princes, a man that bear deadly hate unto Israel with commandment to destroy the people. The king commanded Nicanor, go there and slaughter every single one of them. Verse 27. So Nicanor came to Jerusalem with a great force and sent unto Judas and his brethren deceitfully with friendly words. <laughs> what, why did see the, the Satan only got one trick? You guys know what it is. It's lies. Even when he says it's going to be peace, it's not peace because war is in his heart. Okay, so he sends unto him and he says, "It's peace. It's peace." It says deceitfully with friendly words, saying, "Give me the next verse." Look what he said. Mm, feels like I need a uh, tw twenty-eight. Give me twenty-eight. Just go back one verse, one slide. He says, let there be no battle between me and you. I will come with a few men that I may see you in peace. That's what he said, but that's not true. Because he's going to bring his whole army and have them hiding around the corner. Wait to jump Judas when he comes around the corner. Verse 29 says, he came therefore to Judas and they saluted one another peaceably. Howbeit the enemies were prepared to take away Judas by violence. Give me verse 30. They are always going to lie as part of their deception. Verse 30 says, which thing after it was known to Judas to wit, he came unto them with deceit. He was sore afraid of him and would see his face no more. Verse 31 says, Nicanor also, when he saw that his counsel was discovered, went out to fight against Judas beside Kafar Salama. Yeah, that. Give me verse 32. I need to make this a little bigger. It says where there were slain of Nicanor's side about 5,000 men and the rest fled into the city of David. Okay. The rest of Nicanor's men, they flee into the city of David. What's another name for the city of David? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. So they're in Bethlehem and they're trying to hide out, but we can clearly see who they are because they're Greeks and we Israelites. Okay. Now watch this. Give me verse 33. Verse 30 says, after this went Nicanor up to Mount Zion and there came out of the sanctuary certain of the priests and certain of the elders of the people to salute him peaceably. They don't know what has taken place. Nicanor has left from the battle because they was getting whooped and he decided to go to Zion and out come the priest and they don't know that a war has taken place. So they salute him peaceably and to shew him the burnt sacrifice that was offered for the king. They're like, yeah, come on into the temple. We pray for you guys all the time. Look, there's burnt sacrifices right here. We're praying to our Yah for you. Verse 34, it says, but he mocked them and laughed at them and abused them shamefully and spake proudly and swear in his wrath, saying, unless Judas and his host be now delivered into my hands, if ever I come again in safety, I will burn up this house. With that, he went out in a great rage. OK, but here's the thing. He just blasphemed the most high. He's not aware of what he just did because he said, I'm going to burn up this house. Whose house is it? He's, did, he said, I'm going to burn this place up. Watch. Let me take you into second Maccabees chapter 14, verse 33. So we can get a little bit more information. The scripture says he stretched out his right hand toward the temple and made an oath in this manner. If ye will not deliver me, Judas, as a prisoner, I will lay this temple of Yah even with the ground. And I will break down the altar and erect a notable temple unto Bacchus. Who's Bacchus? He's a false guy. He's, he's a false god. He said, I'm going to tear down the real temple and build a fake temple unless you deliver this man into my hand. Now, see... It was okay before the battle was between him and Judas, but he just included the father. He's like, I'm going to burn down your father's house. And the father was like, excuse me, <laughs> you're going to do what? 
So now he's in the battle. It's problems now, right? Okay, so the priest, after he leaves, the priest begin to pray. And at the exact same moment, Judas is warned that he should pray. So we got the priest praying, and then we got the warriors praying at the same time. Take me back to 1 Maccabees chapter 7, and let's take a look at verse 43. It says, so the 13th day of the month Adar. Let's pause right there real quick. I guess we have to talk about the calendar a little bit because some of us are like, when is that? Is that right after December? When, when is when I never seen that on the Gregorian calendar. We are working with two different timelines. I get messages and emails all the time. People asking me about the timeline because what they're trying to do is find these dates on a Gregorian calendar. So when it says the 13th day of the month, Adar, they're like, well, I don't know when Adar is, but I know when the 13th day is because I started counting on the first of the month. And then I went to the 13th day of the month and thought that that was the 13th day of the month. Let me explain right now. That is not how you calculate the time. The first day of the month is the first light of the moon, regardless of what number day it is. So if, for me to give you an example, what month is it right now? Julian calendar. Com common, it's March. Okay. And we think that it is the third month of the year. It is actually the 12th month of the most high's calendar. We are in the month of Adar now. Okay. What was the first day of the month of Adar? We celebrated it last week. What did we do? It was the new moon. That was the first day. From that day, I count out how many days? 13 days. And that's how I know when it's the month of Adar. Now, if you do even a small amount of research, Google will tell you this information. You can literally say, what month is Adar on a modern day calendar? It won't be an exact month because it has to be between two months because the new moon is going to start not at the first of the month. It usually happens in the middle. We celebrated the new moon on the 11th. This is the reason why we are celebrating the 13th of Adar next Saturday night, 13 days. Does that make sense? That part is very important. When you're keeping track of the feast days, you need to know there is a time clock in the sky that tells you when these things start. Okay, take me back to the verse. It says, now the 13th day of the month, Adar, the host joined battle. So here's the big battle day. But Nicanor's host was discomfited. What does that mean? He got whooped. It says, and he himself was first slain in the battle. Why was he the first one slain? He blasphemed. This dude said, I'm going to burn down the father's house. The most high said, step out there on that battlefield. See what happened. <laughs> I don't care how many men you got. You the first one to die because he blasphemed. Okay. Verse 44 says, now when Nicanor's host saw that he was slain, they cast away their weapons and fled. They're on foot. They're booking it now. They're like, oh, he dead. We can run. Watch this. Give me verse 45. You know, we're not going to let him run, right? Israelites, we're going to chase you down. It says, we come into your mama's house with this problem. It says, then they pursued after them a day's journey. You, wait, you got to understand. I'm chasing you all day. I don't care where you go. Take a break. Five minutes. Okay. I'm still chasing after you. They pursued after them a day's journey from Adassa unto Gazaria. Sounding an alarm after them with their trumpets. What did that sound like? Do, do, do. Oh, they're still coming. Let me hide behind this tree. Do, do, do. Oh, they're still coming, right? That, that warning was keep letting them know we are not going to stop. <laughs> now watch this. Give me this next verse. <laughs> it says, whereupon they came forth out of all the towns of Judea round about. These are Israelites coming out of the towns and closed them in so that they, the enemy turning back upon them that pursued them that's us coming to get them the rest of the israelites in the towns when they heard the do 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 they came out of their house and was like no nah, y'all not hiding here so they turn around and they run smack dab into us it says we're all slain with the sword and not one how many yes. not one of them was left that's a complete end right there now watch what we do verse 47 it says Afterwards, they took the spoils and the prey and smote off Nicanor's head and his right hand, which he stretched out so proudly and brought them away and hanged them up 
toward Jerusalem. What do we do? We cut his head off. We cut his head off because he had a mind to be the enemy of the Most High. We cut his hand off because he made an oath that against the father's house, right? He needed to be recompensed swiftly upon his own head. We read that in Joel. You guys remember? So this is the reason why we celebrate the destruction of Nicanor. He is a picture of the Antichrist. He is the picture of Satan coming to do battle against the children. And he wants to curse us, but the father is planning to bless us. If he had succeeded, we would not be here today. Watch this. It says, verse 48, it says, For this cause the people rejoiced greatly, and they kept that day a day of great gladness. Give me one more verse. Verse 49, it says, Moreover, they ordained to keep yearly this day, being the 13th of Adar. Thus the land, give me one, yeah, thus the land of Judah was in rest a little while. Amen. Amen. So when we celebrate the destruction of Nicanor, we are, just, we are celebrating the Most High's victory over our enemies. That's what we should always be looking forward to. A victory over the enemies. Because watch, finish this verse. Vengeance is mine. Saith Yahweh, I will repay. When you see him repay, you don't got to do nothing. You just stand back and be like, hallelujah. Amen. I got one last verse for you real quick. Our enemies will always fail because of our Yah. You don't have to fight the battle. You have to be obedient to the one who was telling you what to do. When you get scared, you know what fear causes you to do? Fear is a paralytic. It'll freeze you in your tracks. And then your mind says, I don't know what to do. You know what to do. First thing is stop being scared. <laughs> You're not supposed to fear no man except for the most high. Isn't that right? So you frozen in your tracks. You're like, I don't, I don't know what to do. I'm frozen right here. Oh, let me just calm down. I'm holding my breath. Breath is spirit. You guys know that, right? I'm holding my breath. Let me, let me get this spirit back inside of me. Let me get that. And now let me remember that I know who fights the battle for me, regardless of who the enemy is. Let me trust in him. Give me Romans chapter 8, verse 31. The scripture says, what shall we say to these things? If Yah be for us, you say it. Amen. Amen. If he's for you, who can be against you? The enemy can do nothing against you. Amen. All right. So next Saturday night, when the sun goes down, we will be celebrating the destruction of Nicanor. We're going to have a blast, some live performances. We're going to basically all of these feasts that we celebrate, we're celebrating life. We're celebrating the plan of the most high, the deliverance that comes through Yahweh Shai. Amen. This is the message that I have for you today. Hallelujah.